Hi, so, I know what she's thinking. Hasn't she got the hint? She's not funny? She's not... I don't know. Why hasn't she given up yet? Well, it's because I like a challenge. And it's because I am thoroughly argumentative. On the other hand, you might be wondering where I've actually been, considering none of us have been able to leave our houses for the past few months. Well, I actually have filmed a couple of videos. Um, I filmed one about the Asian readathon, but the footage for that has disappeared, and I don't know where it's gone. In a way, it's kind of a bit of a good thing, maybe, because I struggle a lot with actually making commitments to books. I don't like saying, oh, I'm going to read this book next because it gives me a little bit more pressure. And also I'm trying to get through my entire bookshelf in four months. So as you can imagine, I can't really pin myself down. Anyway, today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different and it's for especially for those people who are interested in actually writing books, not just reading them. Today I'm going to talk about the medieval horse. So especially for those people who are writing around the 13th century, this will apply probably through to the Elizabethan era, but I'm going to follow up on that later. This might be a series if it goes well, who knows? But I thought that I'd make a video on how horses kind of work. I myself, I'm not like a true blue equestrian, but I've been riding on and off since I was about eight. So I also have a bit of knowledge from things that I've actually researched. And you know, there are certain things that I read in a book and kind of frustrate me like and also whenever I watch a movie and every horse is either pure black or pure white like where are the chestnuts where are the bays so to start with I'm going to talk about the types of horse the average size of these horses and what their purpose was then I'm going to talk about color then I'm going to talk about the typical armor that a horse wore during the medieval era and then I'm going to talk about gates, and then I'm going to talk about how fast and how far a horse can run in a day, because, oh boy, some of us are really caught up on the idea of a horse galloping non-stop for 24 hours. And I think that comes from the tale of Black Bess, which never actually happened, and also the horse is dying, so, yeah, you know kind of want to keep in mind if you want your horse to survive in your writing, sorry. Okay, so types of horse. In the medieval era, they didn't have breeds as we know them today. Now, of course, a breed is like a particular sort of subsection of the types of horse. You've got like thoroughbred, Arabian, that sort of thing. But in the medieval period, horses were more categorized by what their purpose was rather than their bloodlines and how pure they were and what sort of thing. So the first kind of horse I'm going to talk about is kind of the everyday horse, sort of the any middle class sort of, of course the middle class didn't really exist, but sort of like less aristocratic horse. Because obviously at that time you either had a horse or you walked. I think maybe they had carriages, but I feel like it would have been still, it would have been a good thing to actually have a horse of your own, not just for riding, but also for ploughing and for other things of menial labour that would be better to have an animal working with. So the everyday horse would typically have been smaller, but pretty sure-footed. So you would also, the everyday horse was likely to be smaller and also to be able to survive on less food throughout the day because 
not only did you want a less expensive horse if you were sort of in this lower wage sort of lower income margin but you also needed to keep in mind the expenses of actually feeding your horse they often native breeds which i'm about to cover so they would have been horses that weren't imported and that one could just get for a relatively inexpensive amount of money so the horses that this could possibly correlate with today in today's the welsh mountain pony or also possibly the scottish highland pony or the connemara the connemara and the the Scottish Highland Pony, I think, they actually, they weren't existent in these actual forms back then, but their predecessor kind of existed at the time. It was an extinct breed, or is an extinct breed, whose name I will put up on the screen. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the palfrey. When you think about the Middle Ages, your horses, of course, once you entered a higher sort of money bracket, your horses tended to be a representation of yourself as well, because it was a visual display of your family and whatnot. Anyway, a palfrey was generally a lighter built horse. This doesn't mean smaller, this means they could be a bit taller, but they were generally a bit more elegant. They were bought also for their actual structure, not just for their usage. They were also they could be used for carrying knights into battle and there is research to suggest that um that in one battle they um they called for at least like a hundred palfreys or something because they can carry a lot of weight they were also used for ladies riding um ladies didn't stay inside all day but yes and for this reason they were often a bit more nice to look at because obviously so much of being a woman at the time as well as arguably today was so much to do with your appearance and that's why soccer moms buy a Subaru so yeah the next type that you had was the Corsa which I don't know as much about but they were the horses that were most commonly used for carrying knights into battle because they weren't as expensive as the Destria which I shall now talk about yeah so they were mainly built for the actual purpose of going into battle rather than being looked at the destria on the other hand was both a military horse and a very visual horse these were horses more likely to be in exotic colors more likely to be muscled and the majestic horse that you kind of picture when you think of a medieval horse so for a rough sort of summary, my sort of equivalent of those horses as a visualisation is for, for the all-rounder would probably be a Welsh mountain pony or a Highland pony or that sort of thing. For, for the palfrey, I would probably imagine a warm blood horse or maybe a cob. Um, for a Corsa, I kind of don't know, maybe thoroughbred or those those didn't exist really till the 1800s and then for a destria it would be the more classic frisian or andalusian horse and i'll put pictures of these horses on the screen because i'm not just talking to no one okay so now i'm going to talk about the typical colors of a horse and also the markings so my pet peeve is seeing horses that are white or black all the time on particularly in movies because you know there's so much like symbolism of the white horse underneath a knight in shining armor or the black horse representing evil or sometimes the black horse also represents like majesty and richness and like mystery that sort of thing however I'm campaigning for the more common horse breeds or horse colours that can be just as beautiful. So the most common sort of colour is a bay, which means a brown body 
with a black mane and the mane is like the hair tail that sort of thing then you've got chestnut which is a brown horse with a brown neck mane then you've got a the actual term a brown horse but a brown actually tends to look a bit more black except for the fact that they will have a more tan color around their muzzle and I think occasionally their legs you then don't have white because Typically, if you have a white horse, it's dead by the second day. It's called fetal white syndrome. So you typically have the colour grey. Grey is a gene that doesn't actually emerge until the foal is a bit older. So it will start in one of these colours that I've just mentioned. Um, bay, brown, chestnut, or even black. Could be. Um, but then it will dilute into a grey over time. There can also be different types of grey, so you can have flea bitten grey where it's like you've got kind of specks on it, or you can also have dapple grey, which is kind of self-explanatory. Um, you've then got black, which as you can imagine is a horse that's completely black and has minimal markings. And finally, you could possibly have a roan, because it exists in the Welsh mountain pony breed, which is when you have a browner colour, but then you have these white hairs but it's not the same as grey because it never goes fully grey or white like you know the riddle what colour was Napoleon's white horse it was grey his horse was grey okay so now I'm going to talk about the markings so you've got this star which is a little circle on the forehead then you've got a stripe which is thinner and goes down the muzzle then you've got a blaze which typically is a little bit wider then you've got a snip keep in mind that sometimes you can have multiple of these markings so you can have a star and then a snip or you can have a blaze and then a snip and yeah it's kind of like a birthmark except it's genetic <sighs> okay so you've also got socks on the legs which are once again these are white markings um, you can also have stockings, that sort of thing. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about tack. Tack is the horse person term for the types of stuff you put on a horse, basically. I am also going to be talking about specifically military gear. And I've got notes that I've got to glance at just so... I remember because these are actually things I just researched. Um, so you've got the typical bridle bit, you, which is used for typically steering a horse. You can also have the just the typical holster, which is just like you know for guiding around when you're not actually like looking for much from your horse. Then you've got the saddle and the saddle uh, blanket. That sort of thing. Okay, so now we'll get on to the good and interesting stuff. So, horse armour. Horses started wearing armour right back in the times of Alexander the Great. And for a long time, they were typically made out, or the armour was typically made out of boiled leather, which, of course, you know, cows, da, 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 da. But as military sort of theory started to evolve, the horses of course had to evolve with it because now the horses were as much a target as the riders. Because once you get a horse down, there is also the possibility of your, the rider being trampled beneath other horses or beneath his own horse. So it was very important to keep these horses safe. So they could very well have armour over the entirety of their bodies. So um, the armour was actually referred to as barding, and so barding is just the overall term for horse armour. They, uh, so starting at the face, they had what was known as a chauffron, C-H-A-U-F-R-O-N. I'll write all this on the screen and we'll see. And this was metal, very much like the knight gear and it went started at the ears and went down to the muzzle sometimes they'd have a little pointy little spike out the front but 
I think that was just for decoration, I might be wrong. Anyway, yes, yeah, so this typically became more popular in the medieval age after it, or in Europe, after it had spread from Alexander the Great's military sort of stuff. Um, then, then you had a, a, a crinier, okay, a crinier, um, what would protect the neck, because obviously you don't want your horse getting shot by an arrow in the neck, because then it's all over. Then you have the croupier, which carry, covered the hindquarters, and the, the flanchard, which covered the flank. A note with this is just to also just, it's kind of easy to actually context clues, but these are words I just learned about, so excuse me. The uh, patrol, which which covered the chest. And then finally you had what was known a, a, a comparison. Not a comparison, a comparison. And this is sort of the thing that you often see horses in, in art, because so often art was actually demonstrating an event or like, like big battles. And of course, um, the comparison, which you can hear the word cape in it, a comparison was um, cloth that would either be, be draped over a horse either as more protection or just as decoration. And these could cover the horse from head to toe. And today you can see them still sort of used in jousting. Finally, I'm going to talk about gates and how far a horse can run before it dies or before it stops. I don't want to be too dramatic. Okay, so what is a gate? It's not a fence door. A gate is the different types of way or the different ways that something can move in a forward direction. Uh, that's my definition. So for humans, we have two gates, which is a walk and a run. But for a horse, you have four gates. And of course, this is because, or five, if you are a special breed, Icelandic horses. <laughs> uh, so a, with the human, we have a gate. No, we have a walk and a run. Then for a horse, because you've got four legs, you've got a walk, and then you have a trot, which is faster and a bit more bouncy te technically, so like, then you have a canter, which is my favourite gate, which is sort of the thing that you often see, it's the most classic one that you show, because a gallop takes a lot of energy, and that's why horse races only tend to last for about three minutes, if that, because... Yeah, I don't know. The, of course, this can also, the length that one horse can gallop also, of course, depends on the breed and it's different types of train. But we're talking about horses back then. And when you keep in mind that most battles tend to last for about half an hour to a couple of hours at max, like the Battle of... Alexander the Great against only lasted from 2 p.m. until sunset and that was after they caught them and all that so obviously like horses their strength needed to actually be kept so I think of course the cavalry would be different to the in infantry but still I think the same message kind of applies okay so According to Google, a horse can gallop three miles before it is exhausted, but a horse can trot up to 24 hours with limited... No, they, a horse can... Okay, I'll, let me rephrase that. So, according to Google, the average horse can gallop three miles before it gets completely exhausted and needs a rest but a horse can trot that same amount of distance and be very, very, still have a lot of energy. 
And I mean, it makes sense because we can walk a pretty far distance. Even me, who is a little bit more heavy set, I can walk the distance of my town. And sometimes it might suck. But then you also have running, which I can't do for two seconds. So yeah, what are you going to choose? A trotting horse or a galloping horse? Yes. Um, and so that is why your horse shouldn't be galloping for 24 hours, Susan. And you should choose something other than a black or a white, which doesn't exist unless you're going to go for a cremolo, which means you better be rich as hell. You better be spitting out them coins. Anyway, so this is my talk on military horses, the types, colours, markings, etc. I hope you all enjoyed, and I might do something else like this in the future. Tell me if you want more. Anyway, bye.